All right, I want to record a little review of the legal issues behind the film North Country. The film North Country is based on a book, Class Action, which is based on a real case. Uh, the big deal about this case was it was the first time that um, sexual harassment was recognized as a potential for a class action lawsuit, which makes a huge difference. Um, it's very difficult to get substantial financial award in an individual case, but when you have a class action, you can get substantial awards, you can attract um, more attorneys and better attorneys. So class action is a pretty vital tool for people who feel like they have a, a broad complaint uh, against policy and practices and not just sort of individual harassment. The film differs from the book in a number of ways. Um, one of the ways is they collapse the time frame. Uh, they make the f case um, process difficult and challenging, but in the real world it was much worse than that. Um, largely because it's spread out over 14 years. Um, putting up with that kind of stuff for 14 years is difficult. Now, she was in the workplace for part of that time, eventually quit because of the PTSD and just she couldn't take it anymore. But that means she's going without her paycheck for part of that time. Probably eventually get some other kind of work. But the point of the film and the book is that this was the best paying work in the area. So as Bob Woodward, our, our friend from All the President's Men says, um, the, the legal system is indifferent and absurd. Um, it's a, as abusive as the workplace in some sense. Unable to get help from the union or the management, she files a suit, but she's attacked by the women and the men because the women are just trying to save their jobs. Um, 10 years of litigation, really 14 if you include the penalty phase, they put up with all kinds of abuse, including abuse from the lawyers, probing into their private lives and that sort of thing. Um, initially, they were awarded trivial amounts of money, and, you know, nothing more than ten or eleven thousand um, dollars. The court of appeal said that was based on kind of erroneous legal tests. Sent it back, and they eventually settled for more, something in the area of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. But if you divide $230,000 by 14 years, um, including years that some of these people weren't able to work because they were just fed up with it, it turns out to be not that much money. The reviewer says, you know, people are outraged by the behavior of the men, but also outraged by the mining company that just doesn't care, um, and partly because they share the prejudice against the women and partly because they just don't understand um, that it's important to have a workplace where people don't have to be beat up um, physically sometimes but at least emotionally in order to just earn a paycheck and then the court system you know again as portrayed in the film is pretty ruthless itself an interesting scene um, actually takes place at the hockey rink um, Josie tells Bill, the lawyer, that she wants a lawyer. She wants to sue the mine, the company, all of them. And it's, his response is interesting and I think um, illustrative. Um, so he says, look, the illusion is that all your problems are solved in the courtroom. The reality is that even when you win, you don't win. She says, I know, but I'm right. And he says, oh yeah, I'm sure you are. But right has nothing to do with the real world. Look at Anita Hill. Remember, that's happening at the same time as this case and illustrated in the film. Because she's you. You think you're outgunned at the mine? Wait till you go into a courtroom. It's called the nuts and sluts defense. You're either nuts and you imagined it or you're a slut and you asked for it. Either way, it's not pleasant. Take my advice. Find another job. Start over. And I want you to think really hard about that. Is that what a lawyer should say to someone? Um... You know, in the real world, maybe yes. That's the kind of cold, hard warning that you give. Um, I don't know if you tell them, drop the case, don't even try. But I think you do have to give them a cold, hard warning about how difficult this case is really going to be. But really, do we want lawyers to be this, I don't know, nihilistic, this uh, cynical about how the court system works? A lot of lawyers are.
Now, part of the issue in this case is the timeline. So I just want to kind of remind you of that. So she starts working in 1975, and it's really nine years later that she finally has had it. And she files a complaint with the Minnesota Human Rights Department. Um, they decide that there is evidence of wrongful behavior and they issue a fine. Remember, it's about an $11,000 fine. It's not that much. Um, the company refuses to pay. So at that point, she can now file a complaint um, in federal court. Notice she couldn't file until she had gone through an administrative proceeding. That's part of the law of discrimination. Um, there has to be an administrative hearing in most cases before you go ahead and make the court filing. So that delays the process right there. So it's been four years. Now she files the complaint. Um, several years devoted to deciding whether this is a class action. So basically asking, are there sufficient number of plaintiffs? And really, do they have the same complaint in law and in the same, or based on the same facts? Or is it more individual and therefore there should be individual lawsuits? Eventually, the judge decides it's a class action. Um, interestingly, all of this is being done by uh, a magistrate judge or other judges who are hearing the case. Judge Kyle, who takes over the case and, and stays with it till the end, isn't even confirmed on the federal court in Minnesota until 1992. So, you know, we're um, eight years after the case has been filed, the judge who decides the case um, finally gets appointed to the court. Um, the trial begins later that year, December of 92. The company is found liable um, in, uh, by June of 93, so you know, roughly a six-month trial um, with the breaks and things. And then we have the penalty phase, which continues um, into 1995. And as uh, I mentioned, the magistrate judge awarded a very small amount of money in the penalty phase. So both parties appealed the penalty phase, but um, the Jensen plaintiffs were complaining that it wasn't enough money. So they asked the appellate court, the appellate court agreed with them, reversed the award, threw out the award and said it should be recalculated um, with a, a more realistic understanding of the legal rules. Before that recalculation could be done, the mining company decided to settle. Just a quick look at Richard Kyle. Um, I always think it's important to remember that judges aren't gods and judicial opinions don't fall from Mount Olympus. They're, judges are people, they have a history, they have a background, and their opinions sometimes reflect some of that. Um, Judge Kyle is from Minnesota, born and raised. Um, he attended St. Paul Academy, which in Minnesota is considered a pretty elite school obviously not as elite as some schools on the east coast or elite private schools on the west coast but it's pretty up there in minnesota so his family's doing okay um then he goes to the university of minnesota which is the big state school um he's apparently from st paul so um he's in the twin cities it's easy enough to go to the university of minnesota uh, then he gets a jd from the university of minnesota university of minnesota is a good law school but it's not harvard it's not um, Stanford. It's not one of the elite schools. So um, very respectable. Um, law Review president performed really well, but he's a hometown boy. He's kind of staying around. He then becomes a law clerk at a federal district court. So that means he's working at the elbow of a federal district court judge, learning how the process works from the inside of the judge's chambers. Um, that's a very valuable position. A district court clerkship is nice. Um, it is not considered an elite position. Normally, if someone works at a court of appeal or certainly at the Supreme Court, those are considered elite clerkships. So his is great. And actually, frankly, it's the kind of thing that's going to really help you learn how to be a lawyer, um, more so than being at an appellate court or at the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, he doesn't have these elite credentials. Um, he then goes into private practice working at an elite Minnesota law firm. But again, you know, we're talking about Minnesota. Um, I love Minnesota. I, I have a PhD from the University of Minnesota. I've lived there many years. But, you know, it's not Harvard. It's not Stanford. It's not even the University of Chicago. Um, it's a great place, but it doesn't have a big, powerful name. But he's doing okay. He's um, hometown-focused, Minnesota-focused, Twin Cities-focused. 
Um, for a while, for two years, he leaves his firm and serves as the Solicitor General of the state of Minnesota. That means he's the chief lawyer for the state of Minnesota when they argue cases before the Minnesota Supreme Court or if anything goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, he would argue those cases uh, with his staff, obviously. And then in 1992, President uh, George H.W. Bush nominates him. Um, it suggests, right, he's been um, involved in Republican politics. Uh, Minnesota has been largely a Democratic state. So um, when a judicial position opens in Minnesota, if there's a Republican president, he's going to shop around a little bit and try to find a Republican to appoint to the bench. And that's what he did here. Um, he continued to work uh, full time until 2005, at which point he took senior status, so, so part time work. Um, and then he retired in 2017 and died just a little earlier this year at age 84. So um, apparently it was an um, Alzheimer's kind of situation and he um, decayed a little bit quickly uh, over the last few years. Now, this case is really about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And now you may remember the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a federal law that says um, employers, among other things, Title, Title VII says employers may not discriminate against workers in employment on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, or sex. So on the basis of sex, obviously, is the issue here. Um, the courts eventually recognized sexual harassment as a form of discrimination, sexual discrimination. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Just wanted to show you, this is the signing ceremony in 1964. Um, notice, um, un unusually for the day, there are some African Americans in this crowd of all men. Um, there are some women on the margins that you don't see in the picture, um, mostly wives. Uh, Coretta Scott King is there, for example. Um, to have Martin Luther King in the back is a pretty big deal. Um, Robert Kennedy was there. Um, in the back that you can't really see in this picture um, is Congressman James Roosevelt, or Jimmy Roosevelt. He was the oldest son of Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, his claim to fame here at Chapman is he was a trustee and a professor here at Chapman for a bunch of years. He eventually settled in California, lived in Newport Beach. And he, um, after a 10-year career in Congress, um, ran for mayor of Los Angeles, lost, and then kind of settled into a semi-retired professional state, worked as a lawyer, um, worked in uh, insurance companies, things like that, and then became a trustee of Chapman University and a professor um, of business and policy. So uh, Roosevelt Hall on the main campus of Chapman is actually named after James Roosevelt, uh, not Eleanor, not Franklin, um, but their son, James. So he's in the picture there in the back. Now, the original text of the Civil Rights Act uh, prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, religion, color, or national origin in public places, schools, or employment. Notice something missing there. Discrimination based on sex was not actually initially included in the bill. Um, even the civil rights people who drafted it thought, well, sex discrimination, gender discrimination, sometimes makes sense right you don't want to have whites only bathrooms but you might want to have you know women's only bathrooms so you know we're wrestling with that still today but so they weren't sure how this would all play out so they decided not to include sex or we would say gender in the civil rights act even the supporters thought that wasn't really going to work that wasn't going to be helpful and interestingly um, it was added by congressman howard smith who, uh, though he was a Democrat, he was a very conservative Democrat. Um, that was kind of normal back in 64. And very opposed to civil rights and opposed to the bill. And um, apparently he added the word sex as an amendment, specifically with the idea that that might kill the bill. That people would say, well, that, that goes too far. I can't vote for that. Or at least they could use that as a justification for withholding their vote and saying, well, we need to reconsider this. Um, so there's no real legislative history on um, you know, what the word's supposed to mean, how we're supposed to interpret it, what constitutes discrimination on the basis of sex or gender, and what's actually a, just a reasonable um, accommodation to sex or gender. We don't have any of that because it was just added at the last minute 
just as a way of kind of sabotaging the bill and then unexpectedly it did not sabotage the bill. As I noted, the court eventually recognizes that sexual harassment itself is a form of sex discrimination, or we would say gender discrimination. And today it's well established as a matter of law that plaintiffs can allege gender discrimination based on an environment um, where there is sexual harassment. And the courts now tend to call this a hostile work environment. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission issues guidelines to define you know, how these rules and laws are gonna be implemented. And they define a hostile work environment as um, conduct which has the purpose or effect, notice purpose or effect, intent or unintended, purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile or offensive working environment. So that's how they define it. And notice unreasonableness is in there. Uh, a certain amount of you know, misbehavior, I guess you'd say, is um, reasonable to tolerate. Here, um, from their um, lawsuit, the court notes, the plaintiffs, Jensen and the others, do not purport to raise individual claims of sexual harassment. Rather, the plaintiffs advance the view that incidents of sexual harassment constitute but one facet of their discrimination claims. They argue that the systemic offenses were so pervasive as to create an, opp an oppressive work environment. Moreover, plaintiffs do not seek damages based on individual incidents of harassment, but instead seek class-wide injunctive, declaratory, and financial relief. Now, courts have said, you know, it has to be unreasonable. So for example, the mere utterance of an epithet which, which engenders offense, offensive feelings in an employee does not sufficiently affect the conditions of employment so as to create a sexually hostile work environment in violation of Title VII. However, evidence that women employees, um, that a woman employee, women employees were subjected to steady stream of vulgar and offensive epithets because of her gender is sufficient to establish gender discrimination under Title VII based on a theory of a hostile work environment. So court says there's a difference. Sexual harassment, which creates a hostile or offensive environment for members of one sex, is every bit the arbitrary barrier to sexual equality at the workplace that racial harassment is to racial equality. Surely a requirement that a man or a woman run a gauntlet of sexual abuse in return for the privilege of being allowed to work and make a living can be as demeaning and as disconcerting as the harshest of racial epithets. So Merit or Savings Bank, this 1986 case, um, is the case where the Supreme Court really kind of um, puts it over the top, makes it very clear a hostile work environment based on sex is in fact discrimination on the basis of sex, on the basis of gender. Remember here, the court found that the sexual harassment was in fact a standard operating procedure at the mine. It was so pervasive that the company obviously knew about it and some of the foremen even participated in it. The judge found that the male focused references to sex and to women as sexual objects created a sexualized workplace um, and a sexualized male oriented and anti-female atmosphere. The company made no effort to eradicate the hostile environment existing within its facilities. So just as the court was saying, you, you can't be forced to run a gauntlet just to have your job and get your pay. That's what was happening here and almost literally the case um, from some of the representations in the film. One little side note, I don't know if you picked this up, but um, Bob Dylan is featured very, very, very prominently on this film. Many of the songs that are sung in the background, um, uh, dancing at the bar and just driving down the road are Bob Dylan songs. Um, so hopefully you know who Bob Dylan is. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that Bob Dylan is actually from the North Country. He was born and raised in the town of Hibbing, which is actually only about 25 miles from Eveleth. So this is the environment that Bob Dylan was actually raised in. Um, then he went to university down in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota. Um, 
became you know well known in the community as a folk singer uh, on you know little clubs and coffee shops around the university, and then took a chance and moved to New York City, and you know the rest is history. But they're trying to kind of tie back um, the, the spirit of Bob Dylan, the the mournful, bittersweet sound of Bob Dylan to life in this part of Minnesota because it's kind of authentic. This is this is who he is. This is where he came from. Just another thing to note, um, mining is of course vital to the economy of the area, but it's also devastating. Um, you saw some of the pictures in the film of taconite mining. Here's an aerial view showing it, it just strips the environment, um, creates flooded um, runoff water areas. It's really a kind of dramatic push and pull um, Minnesota, you, you know, you know, might know, the land of 10,000 lakes um, because of glaciation. The northern part of Minnesota in particular is just pockmarked with lakes. You can see a bunch here. And there's almost no way to do this kind of mining in Minnesota without having runoff into lakes and streams. Um, and that's always been a big issue. But the people need the money. They need the jobs because if this stuff isn't there, and believe me, um, it has reduced significantly over the years. Um, then people are kind of hopeless. They don't really have much that they can do at this point. Um, so these jobs were critical during this time period um, and are starting to evaporate now. Hard to imagine how some of this devastation is going to be cleaned up other than just let nature take its course for probably a century or more. Who knows? So. It's kind of this bittersweet relationship with mining in northern Minnesota. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and um, look forward to talking to you more later.